Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk all about altitude training or really the physiology behind how our body adapts to being at altitude and how we can change our training environment to optimize the physiology of what's going on. So if maybe you're an athlete and you're training for a race like Leadville, or maybe you're a coach or a trainer and looking to learn about the science and the physiology of training. So let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, so right off the bat, I want to dispel a myth about altitude training. So really training at altitude or going up to a high altitude to do a training camp or, or to do aerobic training is not an effective means of training. So if we do that and we go up to high altitude, the conditions of high altitude are not optimal for oxygen delivery and oxygen transport and the adaptations associated with training. That said, living at high altitude can significantly change our erythropoietin, our hemoglobin, our aerobic enzymes, and other cardiovascular adaptations that are really beneficial. So we're gonna break down the physiology here and figure out how we can actually use altitude to our advantage in a training situation. So to start off, whether we're at high altitude or sea level, the percent of oxygen in the air is 20.93%. So at the top of Mount Everest, 20.93% oxygen in the air. So the difference really isn't in the percent of oxygen in the air, but rather the partial pressure. And then what really physiologically matters to us is the amount of oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin. So again, the thing that matters the most for exercise is that at higher and higher altitudes, there's less oxygen bound to hemoglobin and less oxygen that's delivered to your muscles. And to put some numbers to this, really we're talking about above 6,000 feet of elevation to actually see these physiological changes. For example, Denver's at around 5,200 feet, and really you need to get to about 6,000 feet of elevation before you start seeing these physiological changes. If we think about other points in Colorado, like Leadville, there's a big 100 mile run race there, as well as a mountain bike race, and people go there. And 10,000 feet at Leadville is actually a really significant elevation to consider these physiological changes. For those of you who don't know, I actually do coach endurance athletes, and one of the endurance athletes that I coach actually did race Leadville. So these physiological adaptations that we're about to talk about, acute and chronic, are really important when we're considering training athletes like that. Let's start off with acute adaptations. So you just got to Leadville, for example, and maybe you lived in somewhere else that's below 6,000 feet of elevation, and now you're acutely exposed to this higher elevation. What is gonna change in your body? Well, first off, immediately, first breath off the plane, you're going to be delivering less oxygen to your muscles than it's used to. Instantly, you will have to compensate by increasing your heart rate. Now, when we think about delivering oxygen, we can think about the equation for VO2 max, which is the cardiac output times AVO2 difference. And what that basically means is the amount of blood that's pumped per minute, that's our cardiac output, multiplied by the extraction of oxygen. So generally that AVO2 difference, the amount of oxygen in our arteries versus our veins, that is about 50%, meaning we extract about 50% of the oxygen that's in our blood supply each time it circulates. That does not change at altitude for months. So when you get off the plane, that extraction of oxygen is still gonna be at 50%, meaning that you're gonna need to pump more blood per minute with the same extraction rate in order to deliver the same amount of oxygen. So what this is gonna result in is an increased submaximal heart rate, meaning that if you were doing mountain bike racing or running and you were used to 140 beats per minute at a certain wattage or pace at sea level, as you get to that 10,000 feet of elevation, that will be significantly changed. It will be increased by up to 50%, meaning that if you were at 120 beats per minute on the ground, if you are not at all adapted, the worst case scenario is you'd be at 180 beats per minute for that same workload at altitude. For realistically, for most people, it's gonna be more like 20, 30% higher, but there's gonna be a significant increase in heart rate and cardiac output as you're acutely adapting to this altitude. And that's gonna make your training feel really hard, and it's also gonna make it more difficult to effectively train, because you're gonna be going slower, you're not gonna be delivering as much oxygen. Until you start to develop some of the chronic adaptations, it's going to be really hard to train at altitude. Now that said, let's say you spend a week, two weeks, a month at 10,000 feet of elevation. How is your body gonna actually adapt? And we'll talk about how much time this actually takes and how you can optimize if you're racing at that elevation, for example. One of the first adaptations that's gonna take place just from living at high altitude is gonna be an increase in erythropoietin. 
So erythropoietin or EPO is a glycoprotein cytokine secreted mainly by the kidneys responsible for cellular hypoxia. Basically erythropoietin is what produces red blood cells. So red blood cells are going to transport oxygen through the bloodstream via hemoglobin. So the more red blood cells that we can form, the more hemoglobin that we have and the more oxygen that we can transport. So if we adapted to a certain level of red blood cells and hemoglobin at sea level and then we go up to a high elevation, we're gonna increase the amount of red blood cells in our bloodstream over time, over the course of five, 10, 15 days, we're gonna progressively increase that number of red blood cells by an increase of erythropoietin. This will allow us to slowly start to be able to deliver more oxygen at that high altitude. And it's kind of hard to give a guideline for exactly how long that adaptation will take because there's also an increase in capillary density, aerobic enzyme concentrations, things like 2,3-DPG, which help with hemoglobin unbinding from oxygen and other factors like that. And these different systems and enzymes are going to adapt at different rates. But as a rule of thumb, it takes about two weeks to adapt to 7,000 feet of elevation. If you go to 9,000 feet of elevation, it takes about four weeks for your body to adapt. And every 2,000 feet above that is an extra two weeks. So if you want to adapt to 11,000 feet, it would take six weeks. And this is a rule of thumb. Some of those enzyme adaptations are going to take a little bit longer, especially things like capillary density as well, because that's literally forming new capillaries into your muscles. And that's a process that takes a while. Um, but for the most part, that's about when we're going to get the majority of our adaptations from those different altitudes. That said, you'll get some adaptation in as little as 15 hours. So in as little as 15 hours, you're going to start this process and you're already going to see red blood cell count increase. So in as little as four, five, seven days, we could start to see some of these adaptations take place. Meaning that if you're racing a race at 10,000 feet of elevation, getting there even five to seven days early and adapting to that altitude is going to help your performance. Now, let's just say that we're elite athletes and financial costs aren't a big factor and we just want to optimize our training. How could we use altitude to optimize our training? Now, we said already that training at high altitude really isn't optimal. In fact, if you go up to a high altitude and train just like you were at a low altitude, you're going to actually become detrained. The reason is you can't deliver as much oxygen. It's a suboptimal environment. It's kind of similar to training outside in the heat versus training indoors in a cool environment. Indoors in a cool environment or at sea level, in ideal conditions, you'll be able to train your muscles with more oxygen and have a better training effect. And this is shown in a lot of research. But to really optimize, what we could do is live at really high altitude and then train at a low altitude. So if we could theoretically live at eight, nine, 10,000 feet of elevation, but then drive, for example, down to 6,000 or 5,000 feet of elevation to do our training, that would really be ideal for the physiological response that's gonna occur from exposure to altitude to increase erythropoietin, to increase red blood cells, to increase enzyme counts. But at low altitude, we can actually do our training where we can deliver a lot of oxygen and have that muscular response. This really isn't practical for most people because you'd have to drive thousands of feet up and down off of mountains each day to train. But there are some workarounds here. You could do exposure in things like an altitude tent or a hypobaric chamber. Using a hypobaric chamber, you would most accurately represent the partial pressure change of altitude. But an altitude tent, which basically just decreases the percent of oxygen, would also simulate that effect and get you some of those enzyme changes and erythropoietin stimulation, that kind of thing. So it's probably the more realistic option for people as opposed to actually living high and training low. Hopefully this is helpful for your training. If it was, go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe so you don't miss future videos. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop a comment below. You can also hit me up on Instagram at The Movement System. Learn more about my training, my training approach, my coaching approach, and what I talk about there. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one.